Heath, and for the next couple of days at least, I am the author of Politico's Brussels Playbook column. And I want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to come to this latest Playbook Lunch event. Uh, it's with Marianne Thiessen, who has possibly one of the most underrated jobs in the Commission. She's in charge of something that is really critical to our well-being, to our ability to provide for ourselves and our families, namely employment. Um, so it's going to be a fascinating discussion today, especially in light of this week uh, being International Women's Day on Thursday. And of course, these events are simply not possible without our sponsors and partners. And today, that is Vodafone. So I want to thank Vodafone very much for participating in this event and for their commitment to the issues that we're going to be discussing today. Now, it's a Politico event. So if you haven't been before, you might not know the drill. We want your participation. So we have a system called Slido. And through that system, you're able to ask questions, and we get through them much more efficiently than if we are waiting to pass microphones along down the line. So if you go on to sli.do, and you use uh, the password hashtag PBTyson, um, you'll see it on one of the screens over here. Um, you can post your question. We will see it down here on the screen, and then we'll get through as many of them as possible. And you also have the chance to upvote questions if you really want to see that question asked rather than entering your own. And of course, at the end, I'm going to ask you to fill out a quick evaluation form. We want to know, are the networking parts of this event great? Did you like me? Did you like the speakers? What else could we do better? Um, it's a constant feedback loop at Politico. So please do take a minute to do that. And before I invite the commissioner up onto the stage, I'd like to invite Sharon Doherty from Vodafone. She is the Global Organization and People Development oh, well Director. <laughs> and it's not Shannon Doherty. That was what I first thought when I saw your name. And I was like, it's a 90210 reunion. This is great. Um, but Sharon, please take it away. Uh, great, to, uh, great to be here. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Tyson, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, uh, look, uh, I think uh, we want to talk about jobs, skills, uh, and inclusion, amongst, uh, amongst other things. Uh, a few words of, um, of context. So I, I think most of us will be sitting here thinking... Uh, the impact of technology on the world uh, that we're in now is significant, whether it's um, uh, artificial intelligence, whether it's the Internet of Things, whether it's 5G. I think we're all sort of experiencing um, the, the, um, the impact of that. And uh, not just in our lives, but I think increasingly in our work uh, in our workplace. Uh, and I think uh, positively or sadly, as we sit here, most of us uh, have the prospect of working into our 70s, uh, and probably our kids uh, will work uh, into their 80s. Um, within 10 years, most of the jobs uh, that we know today uh, will, uh, will not exist, and our approach uh, to careers will look uh, really very different than uh, the experience that, that we have had um, so far. Um, so in, in that context, um, our view is that individuals, companies, uh, educational institutions and uh, governments need to work together actually at a pace that we probably don't quite appreciate if, if we are to take advantage of technology um, and not for it uh, to create threats and issues for people uh, in the workplace, ourselves and our kids uh, as, they come, uh, as, as they come after us. Uh, a few, um, a few uh, sort of areas of particular focus for Vodafone. We spend a lot of time uh, looking at the work that we can do support women and uh, increasingly youth. If we look at, uh, if we look at women, uh, they're 14% less likely to own a mobile phone uh, in the world. Uh, if, uh, we, if we have children and we take a long-term break, uh, we find uh, that actually you, you struggle to get back into the workplace. Um, and uh, as a woman, uh, we will have all noticed uh, the Me Too campaigns that have been going on. Uh, and uh, we've been spending a lot of time working uh, to try and improve uh, some of the issues around domestic violence. So as women, uh, we are heavily impacted uh, uh, um, by some of the e excluding uh, factors that are, uh, that are there. And there's a real sort of how can we use technology to get more women included in the workplace. And if we look at some of the things we've done in Vodafone, uh, 90 million of the unconnected uh, women are inside our footprint. Uh, we've made a commitment to try and uh, connect 50 million of those. Uh, you won't know, but Vodafone... Um, is educating um, uh, 40,000 kids 
uh, a month uh, across the world using our technology. We're working with police forces uh, across Europe uh, to use technology called Texos to try and uh, reduce domestic violence. And inside our company, uh, we're leading by example and introducing groundbreaking, whether it's maternity policies or policies to reconnect women after long-term uh, career breaks. So we've been doing a lot of things inside the company uh, to try and use technology to improve inclusion, skills, and jobs. Uh, we are taking some of the experience we've had with women and moving that to the work that we do in youth. Uh, I stand here as a, a mother of a five-year-old, and I find it appalling that 43% of economically active young people are either unemployed or are in jobs and still living in poverty. You know, I think that that's just um, not, not where we, um, we should be. And we've done some survey work across the world. And what's perhaps even more disappointing is that those young people, when you ask them what do you think about your world of work and your career, uh, actually say we're pretty pessimistic about it. Uh, so uh, actually, in a few weeks' time, the 20th uh, of March, our, our CEO, Vittorio Calau, will be here uh, in, um, in, in Brussels uh, talking about some of the things that we'd like to do, as we have with women, but increasingly uh, in, in, in the youth area. So it's really brilliant to be here. Thank you, Ryan, uh, Commissioner Tyson. Um, uh, inclusion, skills, and jobs uh, is a really important part of our agenda and really look forward to hearing some of the, the debate and discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up, Commissioner. <laughs> After you. Do you want me? <laughs> this one? Yeah. It's always important to have the clock there. That's good. Thanks for joining us. It's um, a really political time right now, and I wanted to start off by talking about inequality and how that relates to your job. Because I think uh, whether you see it in terms of the workers who are displaced by globalization, the gender pay gap, which we know is very persistent and shrinking only very slowly. Um, think about the young people in Italy who have said through their votes in the last few days that they don't think they're getting the opportunities that they deserve in society. And then you look at things like the geographic differences that mark the sort of votes we saw around Brexit and things like that. Um, I think inequality is affecting all of our politics today. So I wanted to get your take on what the European Commission can do about that, because you've got this very important job, but a limited set of direct legal powers at the the EU level, and obviously we all live in a world of, of limited cash. So what can you do about that, and can you give us a bit of a preview of the social fairness package you're going to launch next week, maybe? There's many questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> well, inequality is, uh, is, of course, something that we have to fight. Uh, because what we see, and more and more uh, international, in important international economic organizations also confirm that, is that when inequality is too high, that it's not only a social matter, but it's also an economic problem because people don't invest anymore in their own future. They don't invest anymore in the future of their children, uh, in the skills of their children, in the education of their children, and the whole society is going down. So it's bad for, for a cohesive society. It's a bad thing for a flourishing economy, so we have to, to tackle it, to fight it. But then the question is, of course, what can we do? And uh, we had already heard how important skills levels Right, having the right skills, having good skills, quality skills, uh, and also to have the opportunity to upskill, to, uh, to uh, opportunity to participate in lifelong learning mm -hmm. is very, very important. Because what we see when we look in Europe at, if you look at income inequality, for instance, we look at poverty also, we see that every time again, it's low-skilled people that are worse off all the time. So skills, skills, and again, skills is very, very important. Uh, if you then say, yeah, it is uh, also, uh, we see differences between women and they have a good educational attainment now, they have better results in their studies often than, than the boys, the girls. Uh, but then you see inequality in their career, yes, that's another thing we have to tackle. And uh, what we see is that if we look into the labor market and in the career progress of women, we see that everything is going fine until the moment of children. Mm -hmm. And when there are children, then women are penalized in the labor market and they don't have the possibility to, how can I say, many of them don't have the possibility to reach their full potential in their career. So there is a blocking mechanism. What do we see that it is? it has to do with caretaking tasks? 
And um, we, you see that it, most of the time it's on the shoulders of women. And then, of course, we from the European Commission, we can say, yeah, every family organizes uh, its life as, as, as it wants to. It's not up to us to say how they have to uh, organize their life personally. But what we want to provide people with is equal opportunities and real equal opportunities. And we know that many women want to work more, better, and that many men want to take uh, also care responsibilities. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why from the European uh, side, we did a proposal to improve work-life balance, mm -hmm. uh, where we say that, uh, where we organize it and reorganize the parental leave and other leaves in such a way that we incentivize men to take it up and that we uh, prevent that uh, the leave is transferred to the women, mm -hmm. what often is the case in reality. And is that a set of best practices or it's actually a legal safety net that will apply to everyone? It is Europe. always a legal safety net. It's always about minimum rights. When mm. we have rights in Europe, when we make legislation in Europe, it's minimum rights and member states can always top up. Some member mm -hmm. states do it. Some member states do it in a, in a proper way. But what we see is we have European legislation and there the leave, parental leave, for instance, is transferable for women to men. And in practice, you see that they do it all the time. So it's again, it's even worse for the women on the labor market. And it's, it's not, you cannot say that's equal opportunities because everybody is supposing that, oh yes, uh, caretaking, it's for women. Men, or even if they want to do it, there is not a culture to do it in many member states. So they don't dare to do it or it's not really appreciated if they take uh, that kind of leave. And we want to improve also that culture by proposing new legislation in that field. Mm -hmm. It's still in the pipeline. I hope we have enough support from the member states because they all don't always like this proposal. It's 18 months to go. You've got time. Um, and when it comes to that social fairness package, is the right way to think of it that that is the, the kind of operating manual for the social European social pillar that was agreed last year? The pillar is... Um, the pillar is, uh, is really a fundamental instrument for us. It's a, a compass. It's uh, something that must guide member states and the European Union in, uh, in the social field to prepare people for the future, to prepare the institutions for the future. It, it has a double goal, let me say. First of all, it is about giving opportunities for people to have good living and working conditions. That's what we all want, also in the 21st century. But what we see in Europe is that uh, we don't have enough convergence in the social field. Um, that's not good for a cohesive society, but it's not good for a stable economic and monetary union. So we need more convergence. And that's why we take initiatives on the social field to have more convergence between member states and upward convergence. Mm -hmm. If we don't do anything, the spiral goes downwards, and this is not what we want. But the second thing, it's we have the convergence objective, but the second aim is that we want to adapt people, to prepare people and to adapt our old institutions to the new economy. Mm -hmm. We have new kinds of jobs. Uh, people that work for the gig economy, we say, for platforms. We don't know, are they a worker, are they self-employed? We have very short-term contracts. We have contracts with just a couple of hours. Some people work for three, four employers uh, together. Uh, people uh, as was just told uh, by Vodafone, people change from job more than before. When my parents started their career, they had a job for the rest of their life. Uh, we think that people in the future will, will change at least 10 times during their career. But then you must organize transitions. People are always weak and vulnerable in the transition moment. And what about their social security? So if we talk about the fairness package, access to social security for all, what we want to ask member states is that they look at their social security system and see how they can improve, for instance, transferability. If people change from status, I'm a worker, I'm a self-employed, I'm again a worker, I work as a civil servant, that they can transfer benefits, that they don't lose their entitlements. Because what do people do if they lose entitlements? They don't dare to change. And you have not the optimum allocation of the labor in the labor market. Um, we have to make sure that people can build up social security schemes also when they have fragmented uh, labor contracts and so on, so that they can put them together and that they can accrue uh, the, the contributions to have in the end benefits and to be uh, secured against uh, risks that can materialize. Everybody can become ill, uh, will be retired once, later than before, but we all hope that we will have been retired and then we need an adequate pension and so on and so on. So to make 
to make things transferable, to make them fit better together, to create a formal coverage, also an effective coverage, more transparency, more transferability. That is what we want to make sure that everybody can have access to social security as the opportunity, of course, by paying contributions, to have access to benefits. Sounds almost like a single market for your rights. That's what I was thinking when I was hearing you. Well, it's not that. a real single market for the rights, but of course we also look at the mobility. When mm -hmm. people are mobile mm -hmm. and work in one member state and another member state, and we have 16 million of that in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, it's not that much, but it's, the, it's, uh, it's enough to take care uh, mm -hmm. of. Uh, therefore, we have clear rules. Uh, a real single market for social security. We cannot really harmonize social security rules. Uh, this, the design of the social security systems, the way they finance it, is really the competence of the member states. That's the reason why we come with, I cannot say soft measures, but with a recommendation, because I really want action. I could have said I come with a directive, I say straightly, member states have to take care of that one, two, three, four, and then they don't accept it. And then they can say, wow, this was a good commissioner, strong involvement, the directive, immediately the hard stuff with no results. So I will come next week with a recommendation. Then we, I hope I can have all the member states on board. And we know, based on experience, that recommendations at European level bring a whole movement. People sit together, member states sit together, learn from each other, peer reviews. And not to forget, we steer member states' reforms in our semester process. Mm -hmm. That's all so what we do with the pillar principles. We steer it in the semester process, we follow it up. So every year we come with a report and we give support to member states to do the necessary reforms also. Now we have our first question on the screen down here. It's from Friana Humpel of Eurochild. Um, and maybe she's read my mind, I would say. Um, and it's a question about the pillar of social rights and will um, you have an implementation plan and funding to follow through? So I think we kind of began to touch on that already with the fairness package. Maybe I can sort of hone in then on something like the European Labour Authority that has been mooted. Is that kind of the critical component um, for enforcing these rights, for example? So maybe that's question number one. And then question number two, we've seen with things like data protection that there's been huge leaps forward in rights. So there's these great new rights on data protection and the data protection authorities aren't always so well funded at the national level. So can you tell us a bit about European Labour Authority and how, at the national level, you can make sure those mm -hmm. rights are being enforced okay. as well. Well, uh, on the European Labour Authority, that's another thing, an agency that we will, mm. uh, that we want to create, and we will launch a proposal of a regulation next week for that. Okay. European Labour Authority is an agency that must, how can I say, that must really complete the package that we launched for labour mobility. We want fair labour mobility. We want to facilitate labour mobility because we need it in an internal market. It's a good thing, and we, every, it, it's all, it are also the rights, if you ask people what they cherish most in Europe, is to be, to be mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to facilitate that, and we want to keep the support of the people for that. Therefore, we, uh, we, uh, we have launched a proposal for the directive with a good result in the final trilogue meeting last week on posting of workers to have fair labour conditions. Way, Thank you for that. We were very happy with that. Absolutely. I was very happy. I'm a happy commissioner all over the place. <laughs> but I must say, last week, I was even more happy. Uh, then we launched a proposal for uh, amending social security coordination. We are uh, discussing it in the Council and the Parliament. But what we see, we have an enforcement directive of uh, 2014, and uh, it's transposed in member states in 2016 to improve the possibilities for member states to control. But what we see, what's missing is uh, a level where member states, inspectorates and administrations can cooperate at an operational level. And if we have to organize it. Otherwise, we leave it to member states. They have to do it on bilateral uh, memorandums of understanding and so on. And we will have, again have a fragmented market, let me say. So this is, a and, and therefore, we want to create an agency that will have uh, a double task to, to facilitate mobility to inform business and citizens and to provide services that mobile people and business that want to provide services cross-border, uh, to give them the right information, to help them, to support them. And a second thing, to bring administrations together, controllers together, to make it possible that there are joint inspections uh, that are really needed to enforce the legislation. And this is really what you need, because if you have good material law, let me say, the legislation is there, but it's not enforced, 
your work is not done. I've always said from the start, I want in, on labor mobility fair rules, clear rules, legal certainty, and enforceable rules. And that's why we need this uh, European Labour Authority. So it's also necessary in a fair labour market. Mm -hmm. But on that question, if you allow me, uh, do we, will we have an implementing plan? Some ask us to make a European implementing plan. Others say, don't touch because it's not all your competence. Uh, of course, we are implementing. We, we started already. Huh? We have our, I ha you give me already the opportunity to, to elaborate a little bit on certain elements. So we have concrete proposals. We have the work-life balance proposal. We have the, the labor authority that will come. We have the access to social security. We launched in December a proposal for uh, predictable and uh, transparent working conditions, and so on. But uh, we have other things that we, we had already. But member states have a lot to do. And we also want member states uh, to start reforms. And therefore, I was very happy that uh, in Göteborg, November, last <coughs> November, we had a social summit, the first social summit in 20 years, where we had a commitment at the highest political level that a stronger Europe must move on. And so this is a commitment of all the member states, and they have their task to do also. And we monitor their um, reforms and their situation in the semester process. We have a social indicators list, and already in this semester exercise, we have the whole exercise for all the member states. We monitor them. We will, in the country reports, you see the results. It's far more social than before. And in May, when we come with the country-specific recommendations, you will see also consequences of this. So do we have an implementation plan? In general, yes. We have our own plans, our own proposals, and we, we launch them really at the, at the, at the uh, I can say, in, in a good speed, mm -hmm. uh, as, we, as everybody can expect from the European Commission. And we ask member states to do their bit of the part, their part, mm -hmm. because they also have a job to do. Now, speaking of the social summit and the posted workers directive, I think most people in the room would be familiar that that was a really long, drawn-out political fight. And I was wondering, are there any lessons you think other commissioners and portfolios and governments can learn from from your persistence, let's say, in plugging away? Because you tried and lots of other people tried and they didn't get there in those reforms for a very long time and now you've finally done it. What, what do you think was the secret to, to getting that compromise? Yesterday I was invited by my political party to come and to, I have not to, too much time to be there. And, uh, but I said, now I have to go and explain it. And I even told her, even chocolates and flowers helped. <laughs> <laughs> no, I must say, I really invested myself a lot. I, we launched a proposal. This was we, I was supposed to, de to do a review, a targeted review. The review was turned into a revision because we saw immediately we have to improve legislation. So we did. I was preparing a proposal, first barrier, the Brexit, because there was this uh, settlement with David Cameron at mm -hmm. the time, conditions under which they could continue to be a member of the European Union if the outcome of the referendum would have been we remain in Europe. And you weren't allowed to poke the base. So it was interfering in my, in my basket. So I said, yeah, I have to wait. So I had to postpone the launch. Then I launched it in the end, March 16, immediately after yellow card. 14 parliaments did not agree and said, you are, uh, it's not your competence, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so um, the subsidiarity principle was, uh, was uh, the most important remark. I did not respect the, the subsidiarity principle, but I was respecting the subsidiarity principle. I am not going to explain all the details here, but uh, we have answered all their questions, and I've been to the members, mm -hmm. to many parliaments, to meetings of all the parliaments <laughs> together and so on, everywhere where I could explain, uh, convince them, uh, build up a good relationship to show that it was not an East-West thing. It was not a West against the East, but that it's also important in the interest also of the Eastern European economy and so on. And by having many meetings with ministers, with members of parliament and so on, uh, we could convince many member states in the end. And I must say, I was very happy when we had a general agreement in the Council, the 23rd of October last year, that we had uh, 20, uh, I must count now, uh, 21 member states on board. This means also many Central and Eastern European, because this showed that this was not creating a gap between East and West, but that it was just a proposal to build a bridge. Also in the European Parliament, uh, we had two rapporteurs, two co-rapporteurs, 
um, who really did their job. So also in the parliament, this was a fight, but the co two core rapporteurs, uh, they invested a lot. I was often there also to explain, to convince, they had a great majority. And then in the trilogue, of course, you have to, to, to reconcile the, div the divergences in the different opinions, the different uh, agreements. At, it was also a big work, but uh, I think there was a relation of confidence. And in the end, uh, we had, I think it is a really nice agreement. And I hope that now the representatives of the parliament and uh, the presidency, Bulgarian presidency, uh, can get it through the institutions. Well, now I'll reward you with some fun. It's time for rapid fire questions, um, where we get to speed up the event a little bit. Um, so I'll ask you a short question, I'll give you a binary choice, and then I'll ask for a short answer or a, a choice back. Uh, so first up, we're in Belgium, beer or chocolate? <laughs> beer. Charles Michel or Louis Michel? <laughs> Charles. <laughs> Opera or cinema? Hmm. Cinema? Mm -hmm. uh, Juncker or Selmayer? <laughs> <laughs> Juncker first, Selmayer second. <laughs> oh! <laughs> we got our headline. Um, <laughs> Leuven or Leuven La Neuve? Leuven. I was a. Uh, yes. It's my ma alma mater, so. <laughs> Hard Brexit or soft Brexit? Soft Brexit, it, it depends what you mean. I know I have to you answer can say short, no Brexit. But, uh, you can break the system. I don't like the Brexit, I must say. But we have to do it. If Brexit is Brexit, I hope that we have... It, will, it cannot be a win-win situation, but I ho hope that the lose-lose is uh, the lowest possible. Mm -hmm. um, sun or ski? In the past, ski, now sun. And uh, last question, who's your favorite friend in the College of Commissioners? Wow. <laughs> my neighbors. I like my neighbors. It's Androkaitis, mm -hmm. uh, left of me, mm -hmm. and it's Stylianidis, right of me. And, uh, but I like them all. We have a good college, really. That was the first thing I discovered. I thought the first week when we met at a seminar in Jean Val, I thought, at least this is a good start. It's our nice people. Yeah. Excellent. Um, now, one question maybe you kind of could guess that I was going to ask about it. I mean, there's trade wars, there's the Italian election, and we're all thinking about that. But then another thing a lot of people in Brussels are thinking about at the moment is Martin Selmayr and the way he's just taken over as Secretary General of the Commission. So I don't want you to get fired or anything like that. But <laughs> I think we'd all love to know a little bit about what it was like in the room when he got that promotion. What, what, what was the atmosphere like? What was your reaction to the news? Surprise, because we didn't know it all beforehand. And um, <laughs> good, good to know. Um, so the first you knew was really in the room when it just happened. I don't know whether there were rumors before, but I, I haven't heard about the rumors. I, I was not aware. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was aware about other proposals, of course. Yeah. But uh, this one, not. It was a surprise, but there was a, a consensus. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, no one spoke against it then. I guess what I'm trying to get at is it's not standard employment practice, I might say. It's not your typical job interview um, <laughs> for a public organization. But you think the college is behind it now. And but it's yeah. not a typical job either. That's true. Okay. And all the rules were followed. Religiously. That was the claim <laughs> that... Okay. So you're... you're, you're um, you're okay, because what I worry about for some people, and I'm not trying to personalize it to you, but people put in 30, 40 year careers in mm -hmm. building up their political reputation and mm -hmm. so on. So I'm just checking that you and the college are okay, <laughs> having your reputations tied now to, to Martin being in this important role. Well, I know that of course people are investing and so on and so on, but uh, if, you, if one thing is for sure, I think that uh, we can see and all, all have to recognize that uh, Selmayr was an excellent head of cabinet mm -hmm. of the president. And I'm convinced he has all the, all the, um, all you need to be a good secretary general also. That's actually the interesting point because in some ways I think if he'd applied, uh, let's say through the front door, I think he would have got the job is my personal opinion. I mean, everyone who meets him thinks he's brilliant. So I think he would have got it if he'd gone through the standard route. But maybe let's uh, move on to some more of these questions here. Um, 
because I guess the EU budget is the next big thing. You've got the European semester and then the EU budget planning coming up. Uh, so Joanna Pluchinska has got some votes. She's one of our Politico reporters. And she asks, how will the Commission invest more directly in digital skills in the coming years in the budget? And how will that investment work to support women's digital yep. education? Yep. Well, the question is how. And the second question, of course, if you talk about budget, is how much? Uh, and normally you have to... First, look how much money do we have, how do we distribute it among different portfolios and tasks, and then what are we really going to do? Um, what I am fighting for in, those, uh, in this preparatory round is that we have um, a separate heading in the budget on investment in investing in people. Uh, we have to, in the skills agenda, the first principle of the 20 principles of the, of the uh, European pillar of social rights, sorry, the first principle is uh, opportunities in the labour market and education, training, lifelong learning, scaling, upskilling, and so on. And we all know, we talked about it in the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the session, that skills is of an utmost importance. If you fight inequality, if you fight poverty, if you fight... People with low skills have no got good opportunities. People with the wrong skills have no good opportunities. So skills investment in people, empowering people also, because it's broader than just uh, being uh, employable, let me say. It's more than that. We have to invest in people. And we have a tradition in that in Europe. We have the European Social Fund. We have uh, other funds uh, available, and we must use enough money to continue that, because in all member states, they will have this task. We can support member states in doing the right things, and we have to make this also visible in our budget, mm -hmm. in the amount that we provide therefore, but also in the structure of the budget. And, and we must do it also in a smart way, that's the last sentence, mm -hmm. in a smart way, when we put everything that is about investment in people together, we will have more flexibility in the budget. Mm -hmm. If money is not absorbed somewhere, we can more easily transfer it to some, somewhere else where it's needed uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. And that's the way how I hope that we can uh, build up the... Um, the MFF for the next seven years. And maybe a question now for the, the geeks or the people who really follow um, the internal workings of the Commission. I, it just occurred to me, how does your department, DG Employment, how does it work with DG Regio, for example? Because I'm thinking the biggest section apart from the, the CAP, the agriculture subsidies, is around regional funding support, often to the, the poorer regions of Europe, which is maybe where some of the skills gaps exist as well. So how much sort of day-to-day -day contact do you have, or have you got any visions for how you can work more closely together between your two departments in the next budget? Well, all departments work together, so it's not... Uh, at least that's my attitude, and I always say that also to my services. We don't fight for this is ours, yeah. and that is yours, and don't touch my uh, domain. No, it's just uh, we can do more when we work together, uh, when we break down the silos, uh, and this is what this commission is doing. Uh, now, on uh, the regional fund and the social fund, they are both co uh, in the cohesion family, let me say. Um, do we have to stay together in that structure? I don't think so. I think uh, social fund must be an investment in people mm -hmm. somewhere. Uh, do we have in the future also uh, to distribute, to pre-allocate all the money according to the GDP per capita? I don't think so for the social funds. For a part, maybe yes, but we have... Uh, we need money everywhere, also in member states and, and sometimes in certain parts of member states with a, a very positive GDP per capita. So that's why I think we don't have to stay together in that budget, but social funds will still belong to the cohesion family because it is about also creating convergence uh, and the services work together. And if I can help and support them to work together, they just do. And maybe now in terms of the tough choices, uh, Commissioner Oettinger is going to bring in all the commissioners and all of their director generals in April. And I, I, I think, as I understand it from the letter that he and Juncker sent out to everyone, it was, it's basically to say, what are your priorities or what would you be willing to, to cut loose? Um, skills clearly is a big theme for you going forward. Is that your number one priority or is there, sort of, is there another thing that you would protect at all costs when Oettinger comes and says, Great ideas, but we have to lose some of them. Skills, but broader than that, it's investment in people. I think we have to empower people. We are living in changing times. And uh, as was already said here at this stage, many people are afraid of being the losers of the changes. Yeah. And we s I think it's also um, 
when I was uh, looking at results in the UK, I thought immediately this is also due not only to the fact that, of course, those people were told during 25 years that Europe was not good for them. If you ask them, are you want, do you want to stay or do you want to go, you know that, that there is a big risk that they want to go. But secondly, the society and the economy is changing so fast that many people feel to be left behind. They are afraid of being the losers or that their children will be the losers. They are, well, there is, they are worrying about the future. And I think we have to show people not that we will stop the future, not that we will stop digitalization, that we will stop globalization, because first we can't, mm -hmm. second we don't want to do it because there are also opportunities, but we must show people that we are accompanying them through those, tr those transitions. And this is why we need also money and politics to invest in people, to empower them, mm -hmm. to support them when they are in a transition from one job to another, no job to a job and so on, that we are there, that there are services available, that, there are, that, that they are accompanied, that they are not just left alone in, in, and so on and so on. And then people will, be, will feel, I hope, also better and have more confidence in the future. And this is what we need. We need motivated people, mm -hmm. skilled people, people that want to participate in society, in the economy, and then only then you have a cohesive society. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got some more questions coming up here. Um, a question from someone who describes themselves as Euro cadres. Uh, and they ask, cross-border workers are at risk without EU protection for whistleblowers. Is the EU ready to legislate? Cross-border risk without protection for whistleblowers. What do they mm. mean exactly? I'm not quite sure. I think maybe it's about protecting all people who want to be whistleblowers rather than just certain people in certain countries? I don't know by heart all the rules we have, but I think we have already many at European level on this. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, but I don't know all the details. Yep. But of course, whistleblowers must be protected until a certain level. I think if people see something that is really not allowed, there must be one way or another to, uh, to talk about it. Mm -hmm. We uh, learned, I think, at the Commission in the past, I can say the European institutions learned their lessons. Yep. Now, we've got some uh, work-life balance, well-being questions coming as well. So, Caroline Kostongs from EuroHealthNet is asking about changing, form of work, changing forms of work and how, I'm presuming, the, the stress and the difficulty and the extra hours that come from that can increase inequalities and affect people's health and well-being. Um, you've touched a little bit on that. Um, is there anything specific around those uh, well-being issues that the EU can be doing? Well, what we do, we have also a uh, European agency, Occupational Safety and Health Agency, that has a seat in Bilbao. And what they do is... It's very good work-life balance. They're, absolutely. They've chosen well. They're setting an example. Yeah, yeah but they, 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 do, they do a great job. Uh, what they do is help entrepreneurs to implement uh, legislation on occupational safety and health. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because what I learned when I started in this mandate, I, I was looking through the different files and the different competences. What can I do? What do I have to do? Where are the problems? The biggest problem in occupational safety and health side is non-implementation. Mm -hmm. Why? Because entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs, often don't know what they have to do, how they have to do a risk evaluation. That's point number one of occupational safety and health. So this agency is giving guidance helping, supporting entrepreneurs, social partners, and others in understanding it and in, in, in implementing it. Mm -hmm. And they have actions also uh, uh, on, uh, on, on mental health and stress in companies, yeah. because this is not such a thing that you can regulate. Mm -hmm. You can say, ah, oh, yeah, you have to, to prevent. Yeah, but what do you have to do? How do you do it? What are the techniques? What is working? What is not working? This is more about giving guidance, work mm -hmm. on it, learn from each other, than, than just regulate. Uh, so and by is some of it about self-responsibility? Because, I mean, to make it really practical, let's, let's think of a company like Uber, which is doing what it can to make sure all the people that work with Uber aren't classified as its employees. So do we have to keep fighting to make those companies live up to a higher standard? Or do we actually just tell the people who might want to work with them, we're going to help you as much as possible and, and kind of forget the, the, the company end of it. I think this is also about uh, respecting legislation. Mm -hmm. Or you are a worker, it means you work in the name and uh, for, for somebody else, uh, temporary, otherwise you are a slave, mm -hmm. uh, and you, you get remuneration for that. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the European definition of a worker. We have clear, cl well-established jurisprudence on what has to be considered being a worker. And if you are not a worker, you are <laughs> self-employed. 
and then it depends on the on the legislation what you have to contribute or or what are the conditions of work and so on but i think uh, try to uh, yeah, I know that sometimes people try to say, yeah, uh, I only work with self-employed because it's cheaper, the social security contributions are cheaper, but this is not just a free choice. Uh, you don't choose your, your status. This is, uh, this is uh, defined in legislation, and we must respect legislation, and therefore you need controls. Mm -hmm. Now, a personal question about work-life balance. What's something you do to, to keep balance in your life? Well... I promote it, but I'm not a good example. <laughs> but but you have you need to develop a narrative for yourself always. So what I said from the start uh, of my political career was, yeah, I work day and night. Why? How? And so on. But then I realized if you are in politics, you have to consider your work as your hobby. Otherwise, if you don't like it, you don't do it. As you're volunteering, mm -hmm. you work in the interest, in the general interest, you work for people, and as your professional life. And then you can live with it. But That's I also need a balance. I also mm -hmm. need a balance, and sometimes I need compensation, and then uh, what I do is then sports. I heard you're a big cyclist. Uh, big is a big word, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I'm keen on cycling. Good. I like cycling. Every second year I do a cycling holiday with friends mm -hmm. already since the 80s. Are we talking about We go like into the mountains. We, in the, the mountains, it's not the Netherlands. You're not pedaling around a lake. You're like up I and did down it a mountain. Once, uh, yeah. I did it once, the, what do they say? Uh, 11, 11, I don't know how you call it in English. Elf Stilentocht. Mountain? No, in the Netherlands it's flat. flat oh, flat, flat, okay. flat. Yeah. A lot of wind, but everything is flat. But <laughs> I like to do it in the mountains, in the Pyrenees. And uh, I did, I have a nice palmares on uh, the mountains. I climbed with my bike. But I like it. And if I have no time to bike, because it's also time consuming, mm. I run. And if the weather is too bad, I have a treadmill at home. And it's used. Well, it's this not is the problem with a chauffeur. Like, they get in the way of the cycling and the running. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a bad thing. I wasn't being negative. I, was, I, I would be annoyed. Like, I would, if I was doing your job, I'd want a chauffeur too, because you've got to get from place to place. But then there'd be times when I'd sit there going, I just want to ride my bike. It's not and you like can't that. really turn up to the college and like... Sometimes right. I think that. Yeah. Sometimes I do think that, I admit. But uh, it's just for the weekend, of course, okay. or for holidays. But uh, now that's life. I've got very good sources, and one of them told me your husband does organic farming, that he's got a little vegetable patch as well. Are you benefiting from that? Is that a true rumor? Absolutely. My husband uh, likes gardening. He has a, we have a big garden, and uh, he's, uh, he's... Sometimes I say you are a real farmer. It's true. And on top of this, he prepares everything. He cooks, he makes uh, jam, he makes soup, he does everything. So I'm uh, about so work life good balance. For Women's Day. About work balance, mm -hmm. this part is yep. uh, really uh, household tasks. Okay. More for my husband than for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But he's retired. Well, I think whatever works. I mean, that's my philosophy. You should. <laughs> You need to, if you don't have a happy home uh, where everyone is uh, by agreement, you can't have slaves in the home. Either. We have a you nice divide of, uh, of tasks at home. It's not balanced. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Okay. I agree also when he is uh, present. Yep. Uh, but it's nice for me and it makes my life more comfortable, I must say. Very good, very good. Now, we've got some more questions here on the screen. Um, the Swedish trade unions would like to know... Um, for example, using the example of the company law package, how you are going to mainstream the principles of the social pillar. So I think you already did touch on that via the, um, the fairness package. But on the company law package, is that something that you want to talk about? I think that there must be no contradiction. We can have good company law in the European Union while respecting the principles of the pillar. Mm -hmm. Every, it's all a balance. We live in a social market economy. And we have to, mm, to, to create opportunities for economic growth mm. and for uh, competitiveness, but that is not in contradiction with social fairness. Mm. And uh, we will show it when we, uh, when we make the proposals, when we launch the proposals, that this is really combinable. Mm -hmm. And we, we always, al also here, we don't work in silos, we work together. And then there's another question. I'm going to jump to this one. Uh, where, oh, where are we here? I've lost track of it. It was there and it's disappeared. It was about youth unemployment. So I will uh, 
make a spontaneous version of the question. I apologize to whoever asked it. Um, and it's, what can we do about the persistent levels of youth unemployment in some countries in mm -hmm. Europe? Where, I mean, I think sometimes there is a mistake here where we look at very high levels of youth unemployment and we think like it's a new phenomenon. I think consistently throughout post-war history, Absolutely. youth unemployment has always been higher because you have that transition period getting out from whatever training you were in into the labor market. So it's, it is always going to be higher, but it's been very high in some countries. Um, is that about broader economic structural reform in those countries? Is it about their education system? Is it something where the EU didn't dive in to fill the gap? What, what, what can we do? I think it's a combination of many causes. Uh, if we look, uh, the positive element is that youth employment is also going down in Europe. We are now at a level of 16.1, uh, I think, or two. Uh, and every month again, it's going down. So uh, we come from a level of above 20 on average. So that, uh, that was far too high. Uh, and we have, before the crisis, I think it was about 15. So we are not yet at pre-crisis level, but it's going down and uh, it's going in the right direction. That's the positive news. And in some member states, it's very low. It is uh, four, five percent. That's really at a low, uh, low, low record. It's really uh, amazingly low, like uh, Germany, the Czech Republic, for instance, mm -hmm. um, Estonia also, that are the three champions on this. Uh, but then the, the, the worst cases, let me say, on the other side, it's Greece with the specific problems of Greece, of course. This has consequences, aftermaths of the crisis, but also Spain, Italy, Croatia, still very high. But Spain and uh, Italy, it's above 30%. So what is the cause? Well, we must say, in, and in Spain and in Italy, we always have seen higher youth unemployment figures. So it's not just results of the crisis, results of austerity measures, what often people say. No, it has to do with structural systems in the member states also. Of course, the results of the crisis also. Mm -hmm. And in Spain, we saw that many young people left education because they thought that they co could all work in the construction sector, earn a lot or enough money to survive and so on. Uh, but then the construction uh, sector collapsed during the crisis and they all lost their jobs. And the the what we see is that uh, it has to do, like Spain, for instance, with, uh, with the educational level. Far more, far too much people are early leavers in education. So they don't have, at least they, they don't even have secondary school and they leave. And that they are low skilled and it's very difficult to find a job in the labor market. You have also in member states with high youth unemployment figures, um, the public employment services that are really not working at full capacity. Uh, Italy, for instance, the public employment services, it was, it was yeah, very fragmented. Now they have their... Uh, labor market reform in Italy, so it, we hope this also will uh, help to improve the situation of the young people. Did they do their homework? So thinking of something like the youth guarantee, did countries like Italy and Spain <coughs> implement it the way that you asked them to? Slowly, but they did. When I started, I saw that for some member states there was even not enough liquidity to start with it. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we raised the pre-financing level for the Youth Employment Initiative, that is the money that is supporting the implementation of the youth guarantee, and then it started working. So it started slowly, but it, it's, uh, it's working. And they do a lot of reforms, so we watch them, we see them, and we have to see whether they are uh, really, whether it's really enough or not. But uh, it has to do with many, many things. So it's the skills level, it's the capacity of the public employment services, uh, it's also sometimes the culture. In, in, the, in Italy, we see that young people, even with university degrees, they start working very late. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of time before they have, uh, let me say, what we call a normal salary for a, people, for a person with university degree. Uh, so it's part of the culture also. They are, uh, in some member states, they, they are not so uh, active on the active labor market, let me say. Well, this brings us to an interesting kind of social, cultural debate about the value of education today, where um, if I look at some of the countries that have very low unemployment rates, one thing that seems to be a, a commonality amongst them is that they have quite strong vocational apprenticeship type systems. And we see it maybe more in the context of countries like the United States, where university education can be very, very expensive. But more and more people start to ask, are they getting value for their university degree? And that brings you to questions mm -hmm. like, are the university degrees practical enough? Are they giving employers what employers need to hire people for good jobs? Then there's the question of, okay, maybe people run to low-skill construction jobs instead of getting some good mm -hmm. apprenticeships in the middle. Um, do you have any like personal or 
thoughts or thoughts as the commissioner about that mix of education and skills? Like, have we put university on a pedestal that it doesn't deserve? And do we need to go and have things like vocational education be more of a focus? My answer to the last question is yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. And that is what I... Uh, what we always see, parents want the best for their children. And then they think, yeah, they have to go to the university, that's the best thing that they can have. Then we see people with university degrees, they often are uh, overqualified for the job they do. You can then say, was the education, was the curriculum relevant? Was it labor market relevant? Uh, sometimes this is a question. We have to look at it, and we are doing that. We, have, we created uh, what we call sectoral blueprints, where we put people from the education uh, side with people from the industry together to look at the curricula and to see mm -hmm. what is necessary, what do, what do we really need. I think we need, first of all, young people must follow their, their passion. Mm -hmm. If you like your job, whatever you do, and, and we don't have to, t to, to talk always in levels, uh, I think they must follow their passion and do what they are best in. And then we, we must offer them, I mean public authorities and those who organize education, good quality education. Mm -hmm but not only at university level, also good quality vocational education and training. And this is what we are really stressing, better quality, so that it is attractive for people and for parents of young people to, 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 to give opportunity to their children to go that path. And one of the things we have to do is good quality. It means not just what they learn, but how they learn it. Mm -hmm. Apprenticeship, dual learning, work-based learning, we know by experience this is far out the best. So we must offer more opportunities of this. We have an apprenticeship alliance. We have uh, many activities together with industry, with social partners uh, to, to improve the quality. We have a, a quality framework for apprenticeship, for traineeship, so to improve the quality, but also to create more opportunities mm -hmm. because often there are, is a lack of opportunities. So we need business uh, to create opportunities, to invest in people because it's a cost for them also. Hmm? Uh, but we must make better quality in this way that when people make a choice for vocational education and training, that they know that it is not a dead end, that uh, when they are 18 or 19, that it's not stopping, that they can yeah. uh, go on and uh, make the, the transfer to higher education if at that moment they think that they want to do something more or something else or something longer. That was the timer trying to tell us to end, but I'm going to go for a couple more minutes because uh, one of the points you made made me think we should ask people in the room a question. Um, how many of you here have a university degree? Okay, so that's great news for you. Maybe it means we're not a representative room. But <laughs> the question I would ask then is, how many of you think you need that degree to do the tasks you actually do in the job that you have right now? Okay, it's most people, it's most people. But I, I guess the point I was going to ask But university there, degrees are good, huh? Universities I've are I've got good. one, yeah. I only have a bachelor's. <laughs> I don't... Uh, <laughs> no, I, I do think they're good. But it's um, getting... I, I guess the point I wanted to make was about the Brussels labour market as well, where I think because, um, you know, you need highly skilled people to do difficult jobs, but I think one of the criticisms people can often make about the EU bubble is that we don't look like the rest of Europe for example. But there are jobs that could be done by people who don't have degrees. But it's almost like now you need three degrees just to get an internship in this town, and it creates this very skewed labour market. It, ex it excludes certain people. It leaves people who paid a lot of money, like some of you, um, doing things that um, are below what you're qualified to mm. do. Um, and then there's that situation where I think the Commission and the Parliament are pretty good at their internships in what they pay. But then around town, now you have a situation where hundreds of people will apply for a job that doesn't have a salary often, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's just a very skewed labour market. Do you, do you have any impressions or reactions about what we can be, do to be a more sustainable EU bubble when it comes to our employment practices? Or are there any things you've seen where you want to tell people, stop doing that? I think we are privileged. We just don't have to, to deny we work in an international, uh, not only in an, in an, an international uh, town, but also in an international organization or organizations. Everybody who is here is working uh, in one way or another for Europe, let me say, or cross-border. So then you are privileged. I think you cannot just say, yeah, that you cannot just say this is bad. But I think we have to realize that not everybody is living in this bubble and that there is a, wor a world outside and that we have with our responsibilities to support also that people. And I think that is very important. Well, we all better get back to that world outside. 
Thank you very much for your time, Commissioner. Thank you to all of you for your participation. Thank you to Vodafone for your sponsorship and partnership. Yeah, a round of applause. And we have... I always forget these housekeeping remarks, so I'm going to do them today. I'm going to get it right. Um, yes, thank audience and online viewers. Yes, I've done that. Thank you. Um, remind audience to fill in evaluation forms. So please do take that slip of paper on your chair. Um, and then I want to remind you that we have a Women Rule Summit. We've got a new series. It's an inspiration from something that Politico does in the US, um, and it's called Women Rule. It's events, it's podcasts, it's lots of great things. And we are going to have a summit on the 21st of June. And anyone can come along. It is a ticketed event, um, but we encourage you to sign up and participate. And now please do stick around for lunch and, and chatting with all the other great people who are, have come along to join you at this event. Thank you. Thank you.